Hello world, it's Siraj, and blockchains are so 2017. 2018 is gonna be the year of block DAGs, directed acyclic graphs. You might be thinking, what did you just say? And that's okay, because I'm gonna explain what I just said. This video is about a crypto system called IOTA. Okay, so it's called IOTA, and it uses a distributed ledger similar to Bitcoin's blockchain, except it solves a lot of the issues, or it aims to solve a lot of its issues. And it's getting really popular, and it's about number seven or number eight on the coin market cap website, and it's getting really popular, and I've gotten a lot of requests for this video, so I'm gonna do a video on this. I've been studying it all day and yesterday, so, uh, and, I'm, and I'm pretty excited about what I've, what I've studied so far, so I'm gonna share with you what I've learned about this system today, okay? so before. Before we go into why IOTA is awesome, I want to start off with the problem with blockchains because blockchains are awesome. However, they've got their problems, 99 of them. But uh, no, not 99 problems, just some problems, okay? I just wanted to slip that in there. Okay, so here we go with the problems. The first problem with blockchains are scalability issues, right? There are endless debates on Twitter, on Slack, on Bitcoin forums, on scalability, and there's a million and one solutions to scalability, right? So Bitcoin's blockchain takes about 10 minutes to confirm a transaction. That's a long time, right? 10 minutes to confirm a transaction is a very long time for a system that's meant for micropayments, right? Micropayments for machines, machine to machine transfer. We want machines to be transferring millions of transactions per second ideally, just giant mesh networks of machines just transmitting value faster than any human could. But for 10 minutes, that's way too long, right? And that's what it's become. There are currently 200,000 unconfirmed transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. So if we open this list, this real-time list of transactions, okay, this is real-time, we'll see that there are about 183,000 unconfirmed transactions and they're just flowing in right now, just like that. That's a lot of unconfirmed transactions, and at 10 minutes per transaction, that's just way too long, okay? So that's a lot of unconfirmed transactions because it's taking so long to confirm them. And this is annoying, right? Why would you wanna wait or pay a higher fee for a faster uh, transaction validation or deal with transaction uncertainty? Let's say you're a multinational corporation like IBM or you know Chase Bank, and you wanna use blockchain technology to sync up your different branches across the world. You know, use its ledger to sync up the data and in a, in a permissionless, trustless way. But if you're having to wait 10 minutes per transaction, that's way too long. So check this out. Visa has 2,000 transactions per second. Visa is the network globally. It is the network for transmitting value currently. Bitcoin is nothing compared to Visa. Okay, look at that. Five to seven transactions a second. That is nothing. We need way more than that. So in, in, in comparison, PayPal is way more. So how are we gonna get up to that Visa level? You know what I'm saying? How do we get up to that Visa level? And there's been so many different uh, suggestions. There's SegWit, there's a Lightning Network, there's all these solutions. So I'm gonna go into those a bit. But that's the first issue with blockchains, scalability. It's hard to scale a blockchain, right? You've got massive amounts of computing power. You've got the, the speed of transactions decreases as the network increases in size. Uh, and you don't wanna store data on the blockchain, right? There's this, there's this thing called blockchain bloat, where you don't wanna store data directly on a blockchain. You wanna have a pointer to data that's living somewhere like in a distributed hash table, right? So scalability is one. There's number two are fees, right? So the mean transaction fee, that is the, the average transaction fee for a transaction in the Bitcoin network is a dollar. That might not seem like a lot of money, but that's a lot of money for a network that's meant for micropayments, right? That's, that's the whole point. Visa has that 2%, what is it? 2% charge for, for each transaction. Bitcoin was all about, okay, we don't need that anymore, right? We have, we have uh, fee-less transactions or a very minimal fee. Well, now it's a dollar. So anything under that is worthless, right? Because the fee is gonna be greater than the transaction amount. So micropayments under a dollar are virtually useless or impossible now. And this can be more than the transaction amount itself, right? So solutions include increasing the block size, using Lightning Network, central servers for off-chain transactions, like using Coinbase, for example, side chains, tree chains, there's a lot of proposals, and there's a lot of ways that the core developers and just the, the Bitcoin community is doing to fix that. I'm not saying that they are not trying to fix it, they are, uh, but it, it's still, it's still, um, it's not fixed, right? There are still, the fee still exists. So if we look at the fee over time, 
It's just going straight up. It's just exponentially over time for transmitting even 0.01 BTC, which is what this uh, graph is. So there's a lot of computing power required to maintain the Bitcoin blockchain as well, as you probably know. And mining has become somewhat centralized by these giant mining pools, right, in China mostly. But that's, that's a lot, like take, take a look at this chart right here of the distribution of Bitcoin mining power, right? If you look at Ghash and BTC Guild, together they make up 55% of the network. Two pools make up the majority of the network's mining power. Now that is centralization. Okay, that is a lot of centralization for a supposedly decentralized network. And transaction speed declines as the network increases in size as more transactions compete for the limited block spaces. So it's going to take more and more computing power to mine the same amount of Bitcoin. You got to buy these ASICs. If you want to be a miner, you got to put the money in. Okay, you got to buy some giant ASICs, ideally, if you want to make some profit and then, you know, meter your electricity costs, etc. But I mean, just look at this. This is the hash rate. You know, the, the cost it takes to mine a block, just going straight up, which means you need way more computing power to mine the same amount of Bitcoin that you would otherwise. Okay, and lastly, one more problem. They're vulnerable to quantum attacks, right? So Bitcoin uh, and other proof of work based blockchains are susceptible to being broken by a powerful quantum computer. So here's why. The proof of work algorithm, and I've talked about this in previous videos, but the proof of work algorithm is trying to solve random mathematical problems, right? It takes a, a certain amount of time to solve these problems. So for a miner to generate a suitable hash to generate a block, they've got to check around two to the 68th nonces, that means numbers only used once, to find that suitable hash. So a quantum computer would need the square root of n operations to solve a problem that would normally need n operations on a classical computer. So that's, a, that's, that's just an order of a magnet, order of an order of a magnitude difference. So a quantum computer would need, if we calculated it out, which I did right here, is a quantum computer would be 17 billion times more efficient in Bitcoin mining than a classical computer, right? So, right, so the network requires lots of computing power to maintain its security. And if a, if a bad actor gained control of more than 51% of nodes, that means they have more than 51% of computing power, then they would be able to double spend. That means change a transaction history and spend money that they don't actually have. And that would break the entire network. And everything is based off of classical computing, right? The laws of classical computers. However, quantum computers could do this 17 billion times faster. So with just one very powerful quantum computer, an attacker could break the entire network. And this is very dangerous. And we don't have a quantum computer like that right now. It's all theoretical. But there are advances being made in this space and it's, it's gonna happen. So we need some sort of quantum attack resistance mechanism. And I've got this little uh, infographic here on how a quantum computer works, uh, but the most basic ELI-5 uh, explanation I can give right now is that a classical computer uh, only computes ones and zeros, so they're binary uh, operators, whereas a quantum computer uses, instead of a bit, a qubit, which can be both a one, a zero, and a one and zero at the same time. So it's a superposition of two different bits. And this allows for types of computation that would not be possible on a classical computer. I actually have a great video on this in a part of my Math of Intelligence series. It's called Quantum Computation. So check that out, just search Siraj Quantum Computation. Let's keep going here. Okay, so those are all the problems with the blockchain. So let's talk about why IOTA as a crypto system is different from a blockchain. So the first big difference is the structure. So like I said, blockchains are so 2017, IOTA uses what's called a block DAG. Okay, a directed acyclic graph. I just want to talk about the directed acyclic graph for a second, okay? So DAGs are not new. A DAG is just a hierarchy of nodes that are connected to each other, where no node is a descendant of itself. That means there are no cycles. That's the word acyclic, there are no cycles, right? So it's just a hierarchy of nodes that are connected to each other in one direction. So there are a million different ways that you could structure a DAG, but that's the basic idea. No cycles in this graph. You could think of a file system as a DAG, right? Because it's just a hierarchy of nodes, right? Folder within a folder within a folder. Git. The, the, the protocol that GitHub uses, that's a DAG. Uh, IPFS is IPFS, the Interplanetary File System, that's a DAG. In fact, 
You could even think of a blockchain as a DAG, right? Because a blockchain doesn't have cycles, but it's, it's a very specific type of DAG in that it's a singly linked list. It's a glorified singly linked list that is, a, that is secured by the proof of work algorithm. A DAG is more general. Like, so here's, here's an image right here. So blockchains are just blocks that are pointing to each other in one direction and Tangle, which is what they call, which, which is what IOTA calls its, uh, it's another word for its DAG. I'm just going to call it DAG. Guys, I know you, I know the IOTA guys are watching this right now. Let's just call it DAG, please. Let's not add more terminologies to this just for adoption. So blockchains are sequential chains where blocks are added in regular intervals, right? But, uh, IOTA's data structure, the DAG is able to achieve high transaction throughput by parallel parallelizing validation. No transaction fees occur occur for any transaction. As it grows, more participants make transactions and the overall system becomes more secure and faster with confirmation times slash transaction finality going down. What that means is as more nodes are added to the network, the network's transactions actually get approved faster. And that's in direct contrast to the blockchain. The more nodes there are, the slower the transactions are approved, right? And the longer it takes for a transaction to be approved. Whereas in the block DAG that IOTA uses, the more nodes there are, the faster the transactions are approved, which is a much more scalable architecture. And you might be wondering, why is this? But I'll go into that in a second. Okay, so it's still a distributed database. It's still a peer-to-peer -peer network. It still relies on consensus and a validation mechanism. So those things are all the same. It's just a structure that is different. And the type of consensus and validation mechanism, that's different too, right? And it scales, like I said, it scales. As blockchain scale, the usability goes down. As IOTA's DAG scales, the usability goes up. So here's the big difference. Here's big difference number two. There are two big differences, right? So the first one is the structure. The second one is consensus. So there are no miners. So people who want to be miners, too bad, you can't be miners. That's okay. This is a good thing for the network. Here's why. So in so blockchain consensus is achieved by requiring multiple parties to race against each other in an attempt to add the next block to the blockchain and get the block reward, right? So miners are competing to mine the next block the fastest using their computing power and whoever's first to do it gets to mine it and then they get the reward. But because of this, consensus is decoupled from transaction generation. You have this whole separate group of nodes in the Bitcoin network that are dedicated to mining, right? And the, the, then all the participants in the network that are not miners, all they do is just generate transactions, right? I want to pay for this. I want to receive this. I want to pay for this. I want to receive this. And because it's decoupled, that leads to further centralization, right? Because the, these mining pools can occur. But in IOTA, there's no decoupling. The, all the nodes are miners in a way, or they're not miners. Here's how it works. So in IOTA, every participant in the network making a transaction also actively participates in the consensus. Here's how. Every time you make a transaction, you reference two transactions directly, and, and in a way, other transactions in the sub DAG indirectly, just by referencing two. So there are no blocks in the classical sense. Instead, a single transaction references two past transactions. Right, so here's, here's, a, here's the graph. It bundles all transactions in a directed acyclic graph. It's self-regulating consensus, no longer decoupled to a set of miners. And it's very scalable with a low overhead proof of work to prevent spam. So check this out. The green blocks are transactions in which consensus was achieved. The red blocks are transactions where we are still uncertain on their full acceptance. And the gray blocks are unconfirmed transactions. Ideally, we want all of these transactions to be green, right? So from right to left or left to right, depending on how this works, uh, eventually all the nodes will be verified if the nodes pointing to it verify that it is indeed a valid transaction. And there are no transaction fees because there are no miners. You, when you make a transaction, you have to approve two other transactions and then you have to perform the proof of work algorithm. So in a way, you get paid by not having to pay a fee, right? So because you're computing this proof of work, which is for civil resistance, right? Because you're computing that proof of work, you get to make a transaction without there being a fee. And that is your reward. So there are no transaction fees, which is awesome. So instead of a smaller subset of the network, 
being responsible for the overall consensus, i.e. the miners, the entire network of active participants, i.e. the devices making the transactions, are directly involved in the approval of those transactions. And so consensus in IOTA is no longer decoupled from the transaction making process. It's an intrinsic part of it, and that's what lets it scale without any transaction fees. Oh, and one more thing, like I said before, it's quantum it's quantum resistant. It's not susceptible to quantum attacks. And why is this? Well, it uses an algorithm called a Winternitz one-time signature. I can make an entire video on how Winternitz one-time signatures work. I'm not gonna do that because it would be too long, but check out the link uh, right here in this Jupyter notebook, which is in the GitHub, by the way. Okay, so here's a little picture of it. All right, so, so here, okay, so you might be confused by this process of making a transaction. Let me clarify it. So it's a three-step process. It's a three-step process. So the first step, like, so let's say I want to pay, you know, I'm a machine, I want to pay this other machine, or even I'm a human, you know, I want to pay this other human. Here's how it works. The first step is to sign the transaction input with your private keys. What that means is you've got a unique set of private keys that identify you as a unique individual node in the network. When you sign a transaction, that you are hashing, you are creating the hash of that transaction using your private unique unique uh, 25 character key, which means a transaction will be both unique and linked to you. So you sign it with your private key. Then step two is tip selection, right? So tips are the, what IOTA calls these unconfirmed transactions. So it uses, the Monte, it uses the Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm to randomly select two tips, these are unconfirmed transactions, which will be referenced by your transaction. And in the code, these are called the branch transaction and the trunk transaction, right? So once you've signed your transaction, you then point to two unconfirmed transactions that you're gonna have to approve before your transaction is generated and validated. So, th so that's, that's what you're paying for this. And step three is to perform the proof of work algorithm. In order in order to have your transaction accepted by the network, you need to do some proof of work, similar to Hashcash, similar to Bitcoin, right? And this is for Sybil resistance, right? It's all about computing power, right? You don't want any of the nodes in the network to gain control of the network by having the majority of the computing power, and that's what proof of work prevents, because everyone has to compute this, you know, random mathematical problem. A, a node would have to have more computing power than the rest of the, an attacker would have to have more computing power than, the, than half the network in order to double spend. So proof of work is for double spending. Tip selection is computed using the Markov chain Monte Carlo process. I also have a video on how this works. It's a part of my reinforcement learning series. I could go into a whole video on that, uh, but it's called Monte Carlo prediction. Just Google that. But um, in short, this is a, a probabilistic algorithm that samples randomly using distributions. So it's, uh, so, so Markov chain Monte Carlo methods sample from a set of nodes randomly using a distribution function. Okay. So once you've completed, completed these three, three steps, your transaction will be broadcast to the network and someone else will come along, choose your transaction in the tip selection process and validate it. And just like that, your transaction is confirmed. So that's why it, the network gets faster. Transactions get faster as the network scales because the more people there are in the network, the, the faster uh, your transaction will be validated because there are more people available to confirm your transaction, right? So that's why it scales as, as there are more people. Okay, so I do wanna say one thing. So there is this concept of the coordinator right now in IOTA. And so the coordinator is, uh, is run by the IOTA Foundation, the people who, who you know, made IOTA. And the coordinator checkpoints valid transactions, which are then validated by the entire network. Um, it cannot go rogue as this coordinator is being checked and validated by the entire network. But what this means is, first of all, it's very hard to bootstrap a blockchain, right? Because you need, it's, you need a certain amount of nodes there to, for the computing power to be greater than what an attacker would have, right? In order to uh, gain control of the network. Because Bitcoin is so big as a, as a, as a system, the amount of computing power an attacker would need is way too big, right? But when you're starting a blockchain that relies on the proof of work mechanism, you gotta have some kind of system in place to prevent um, a, a bad actor from taking over, some sort of civil resistance. So the way the, I the IOTA Foundation has sought to prevent this is by creating this coordinator that is run by them. So it's centralized, yes. It's a centralized node that validates transactions temporarily 
They've been clear about this since the beginning, which I like. And uh, yeah, it's centralized. That's a bad thing, but it's it's a temporary thing. And uh, I think that I mean their goals and their and their aims and their white paper. It's it's it all seems to be pointing in a decentralized direction. But it's a temporary mechanism to validate transactions at the start. Uh, but eventually, they're not going to need it or want it, and it's going to go away. So I just want to mention that. Okay. So use cases, right? So first is data integrity, right? So. Uh, there's this mechanism to send messages, secure messages between different nodes in the IOTA network, which allows for uh, nodes to communicate data, right? And because there is this distributed ledger that there is consensus on that is permissionless and trustless, you can be, you can ensure that the data that is being passed between these nodes is, is valid. And data integrity is super useful for any kind of hospital records or you know any kind of secure records that we need to you know government law legal uh, you know anything that needs a lot of security this would be great in a trustless permissionless systems supply chains right importers exporters shipping liners logistic companies right they're all over the world they're global and they need to sync up on data and you know what the what the status is of you know a delivery and what the status is of this and this and this and this and that's a perfect use case for distributed ledgers like IOTA Right. And I mean, this, this system was meant for the Internet of Things. Right. So and when it comes to the Internet of Things, we are we need ways to share bandwidth, computing power, resources, uh, you know, data, all sorts of these things. And that is what this would be good at or any kind of grid as well. Solar grid, microgrid services, electrical grid, just any ways to share resources that doesn't need a human in the loop, just automatic systems that are trustless, permissionless, that coordinate uh, scarce resources amongst groups of people. Uh, this would be a great use case, right? So its key features are infinite scalability, uh, no fee microtransactions, and quantum resistance. Three key features that <clears throat> would be awesome to have. So, I mean, the network already has 100 million in transactions that have occurred without fees. Uh, yes, it's using a coordinator right now. Eventually, it doesn't need to, or they don't want it to be there. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. I mean, the promise of no fee transactions and a network that scales really well and gets better in terms of the speed of transactions over time, that is a that is a promise that I like. Okay, and I want that to happen. We should want that to happen. IOTA is a proof of concept. I mean, everything in this space is a proof of concept. Bitcoin is even a proof of concept. What what I mean by that is it is not production ready yet, nor is Bitcoin even. But uh, I like where this is going. I mean, these guys seem to have know their stuff. Like they worked on Next, which was this this first asset transferring uh, service that uses blockchains in 2010, 2011. So they've been in the space for a while and uh, you know their, their pre-mine was a modest, I think something like 500K uh, and all the coins are, are, are generated. All of them that can be created have been created. So it's, um, I think it's a cool system and I, and I wanna see more of it. I wanna see more development of it, more interest, more excitement because uh, yeah, we need no fee uh, we need no fee distributed ledger services, right? That's how we're going to really get this internet of things, of things that are communicating and transmitting value at millions of transactions per second faster than Visa, or is a magnitude faster than Visa. Screw Visa, we just go a million times a second, okay? That's where we wanna be. And if we can just bypass all of these issues that are coming up as the, as the Bitcoin blockchain scales and use something like IOTA, that would be awesome. So. I think that yes, there's still some problems and they have a lot of promises, but if they can come through with them, and I think that they can, that would be awesome for everybody. Okay, so uh, let's, let's look at the code for a bit. So they've got this GUI client, uh, which is really cool. If you wanna just the easiest way to get started, this would be it. It's built in JavaScript. Uh, you can use NPM to install it. It's based off of the Electron wallet and uh, instructions are here in this GitHub repository. One more thing is the client library in Python. So the base library is in Java, but they've got client libraries in Python, in JavaScript, uh, and in C, I think C as well. But it's all on their GitHub right here at IOTA Ledger, which you can look at right here, Java, they've got the command line app, they've got an Android wallet. Um, yeah, they've got, they've got a lot of repositories here to play with in some different languages. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna just download this and just run it just, just cause. So let me download that. And I'm going to open in terminal, let's see. 
Let me go right into that folder. Okay, so pip install Pyota. Okay, there we go. Uh, right, sudo pip3 install Pyota. All right, so I've got IOTA up and running. I have a full node running on my computer and using once I have this node running, I've downloaded the Java client and then I can use any of the, the uh, Python or the JavaScript uh, CLI libraries to then you know integrate this into a web app or a mobile app or whatever kind of app I want. But it's a pretty lightweight uh, client and it's easy to integrate into a web app or mobile app so you can use it for you know having an online wallet or whatever payment system or, or any kind of uh, system you want to create. The last thing is how to buy IOTA. So I found this great tutorial on bitfinex.com, which is this website, it's, a, it's an online exchange on how you can buy IOTA with Bitcoin. So it's a five step process, but first, first step is to make sure your funds are on the exchange wallet. So they have three dedicated wallets that you could use and you can instantly move your funds from one wallet to another on the wallets page, which is right here. And so you can go to the trading page and choose the pair you want to trade. And then there's an order form in the exchange tab. You could click exchange buy, and then the order is gonna appear. If you, so you gotta have Bitcoin in order to uh, buy IOTA coin. And if you wanna buy Bitcoin, then I would suggest using Coinbase uh, as a, the most reliable way to buy them. Uh, it You can do this from virtually any country, I think, at this point, but uh, you link up your credit card or debit card or bank account, buy Bitcoin, and then transfer that Bitcoin to a wallet, and then from that wallet, buy IOTA on Bitfinex, or uh, there's a couple of exchanges actually, but I think Bitfinex is, is the one to do. Please subscribe for more programming videos, and for now, I think I'm gonna go buy some IOTA, so thanks for watching.